Katarzyna Bojarska is an assistant professor at the Institute of Literary Research of the Polish Academy of Sciences and a member of the editorial team of the academic journal uh, View of Theories and Practices of Visual Culture. She was a full grade uh, researcher at Colorado University and the University of Illinois in Chicago and she is an author of a book entitled uh, <coughs> The events after the event, the Awashas, the uh, Spiegelman, uh, and also uh, a translator of uh, the Polish of the book of Susan Beckmore's Hegel Hate in the Universal History. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. Um, hi, welcome. Um, I'm very, very honored and pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation to the organizers. It's been so far it's a fantastic symposium. It's really great to be part of it. Um, so there was a funny typo in the title of my presentation. Um, so it's divided the stand or revolutionary luck in the making, and uh, not all revolutionary luck in the making, but it's always happened to me somehow. Well, anyway, I'll present uh, something that is part of a bigger research project that you can see here. It's called Repass, representing the past, anticipating the future, where I was looking at uh, kind of similar um, kinds of uh, things, a crisis that is invoked by so-called troubled pasts in different European countries and the a memory of that troubled past that causes um, crisis in the present and how we anticipate the future, better future uh, through works of art and cultural artifacts. Uh, so first part of this presentation is I brought up a couple of um, theories and concepts and ideas uh, that were very useful for my thinking and I want to share them with you and the, the other part is um, concentrating on a couple of Examples, which are not really examples, you'll, you'll see how that works. So my, um, my, my work has been recently inspired by the work of Lord Bernard, <coughs> American scholar, um, literary scholar, but also a person who contributed uh, immensely to so-called affect studies and affect theory, um, especially with her book, uh, Cruel Optimism, from 2011. Uh, and so I'll be looking at, you know, in terms of, you know, the community that we uh, wanting or we projecting about sharing fantasies, uh, departing from fantasies, from certain fantasies that we share and allowing uncertainty and allowing those moments where we negotiate the fantasies that we then pursue. So this uh, presentation has a motto and it comes from Berlin, uh, and I quote, political realism can be theoretical. It can become a foundation for change. Political fantasy can be ridiculous and self-defeating. It can ground and sustain an aspirational thinking beyond pragmatics that insist on new materialism. Participating in the discussions about memory and undergoing collective analysis through cultural moments of rapture and dissonance, and in thinking about the future of the memory of Polish collective, I'd like to work with the idea of future perfect as Jacques Lacan formulated it soon after World War II, and I quote from Lacan. What is realized in my history is not the past definite of what was, since it it's not, it, it is no more, or even the present perfect of what has been in what I am, but the future interior of what I shall have been for what I am in the process of becoming." And This temporality gives us a chance for a reconfiguration of the coordinates of what we are, of our identity, for undermining this intolerable impasse, the condition of being stuck. We are stuck with our fantasies of ourselves and of our past, and with the paralyzing fear of having these fantasies taken away. This undermining can be done by a transformation of images and narratives composing our history. It is being done by different agents and in different media or genres. The futurity Lacan describes seems to be, and I quote from Rose, directly Rose, neither simply backward-looking nor forward-looking that gathers the shreds of the past as it moves forward in time, end of quote. It is about digging deep in and across the archives to fish out the possible events, discover analogies and symmetries previously overlooked, to come across unthinkable scenarios and claim them as our own, and to take care of them for the sake of the shared fantasy of creating a different world. We've seen an example of how this is being done uh, in the lecture by Stephen Buckmore's uh, last night. We seem to be struggling with this fantasy in a very specific historical present, uh, the stretched out moment with its very specific historical, historical sensarium, whereby we are, as Lauren Berlant wrote, forced, and I quote from Cruel Optimism again, to adjust emotionally to the process of living with the political depression produced by brutal relations of ownership, control, security, and their phantasmatic justifications in liberal political economies, 
And just to remind you, she wrote it in 2010 and it was published in 11. It was before the, the Trump, before Trump was elected as president of the state. So the sensorial slightly shifted already. Um, the stretched out historical present as a transitory moment, also between different fantasies and only between different uh, narratives. A moment full of intensities, and hence the turn to affect seems so important. Uh, and as she calls it, a moment without edges, where recent past and near futures blend. This moment is noisy, it is buzzing, and it is polymorphous and hopeful. Verlant makes us observe as it slows down our things and performatively democratic activity by linking it to a context where solidarity comes from the scavenging for survival that absorbs increasingly more people's lives rather than from an anxiety about reasserting the potentiality within the political as it has long been known and exerted pressure on fantasy. The urgency is to reinvent from the scene of survival new idioms of <coughs> political and of belonging or attachment, it's all her words now, or attachment itself, which requires debating what the baselines of survival should be in the near future, which is now the future we are making. And that's the very end of the book and the end of the book. This year, on the 1st of September, on the 18th anniversary of the outbreak of World War II in Poland, the anti-fascist year was announced. An independent grassroots coalition of cultural institutions, NGOs, social movements, self-governed collectives, and individual activists and artists who have joined in to create a network of anti-fascist and anti-war events and activities in the stretch out the present that we are living in now in Poland but also elsewhere. Oh, this kind of solidarity, not in despair, that's the crucial point in Berlin's argument, but in living on, in living on, in living on ordinary lives, but also extraordinary situations, living through those situations, entails new visual political dictionaries. Photography theories that realize why offers a definition of what she calls visual citizenship that foregrounds its potential, its potential as a political practice, distinguishing, uh, distinguishing this kind of um, citizenship from the model of citizenship inherited from the French and American revolutions, which treats citizenship as a property that is unequally distributed by the regime and defined as an act of subordination to power. Visual citizenship, as White claims, allows us to rethink the idea beyond our relationship to power. It starts with the act of spectatorship, says as White. There's a brilliant, huge argument that she elaborates in her book, uh, Civil Culture of Photography. Again, she's theorizing from a very particular perspective, and that is the perspective of the Israeli Palestinian conflict that she was born into and she's living through. And that's, that's where she stands from, and that's where her kind of historical sensorium is being uh, loaded, let's say. In the terms of regime made disasters, the same regimes causing the disaster make us not to see the disaster as it is happening. The control of visuality, the production of it, has to be countered and one has to recognize oneself in the image of the disaster, not via, and that's all as well as idea, an act of empathy or identification with the victim, that's, that's not the point. But in being implicated, in realizing we are governed by the same power which instruments the disaster and blinds us at the same time. Visual citizenship is thought of as a relationship among various protagonists, not necessarily mediated by or identified with sovereign power. As visual citizens, as Azulai convinces us, we must work not to sacrifice history, politics, and agency to the reductive forms of presentation. And another thinker I'm kind of working with. In her passionate manifesto entitled Whites, Jews, and Us Towards Politics of Revolutionary Love, Korea Botelgia targets the left, especially French left, the innocent, the righteous, the helpless, the engaged. She hits hard in order to smash the frameworks which discipline our attachments to the political. She convincingly identifies the misencounters, the vulnerabilities and insecurities at the thresholds between races, sexes, and emancipatory struggles. She writes, and I quote from the book, I am beginning to understand that the sight of a real encounter can only happen at the crossroads of our mutual interests, the fear of civil war and chaos, the sight where races could annihilate each other and where it is possible to imagine our equal dignity. Because I tend to give in to sentimentality, I wonder if this is not a space of love, revolutionary love." End quote. Who tells you, like Berlant, like Azulay, and like Back Morris, among many other women artists, thinkers, and fighters, 
makes a choice of heritage, takes care of the people of another history. From inside the stretched out present, in vulnerable times, and on the moving ground of political, of political imagination, the love is being made. And I quote again the concept of revolutionary love. To produce this love, there is no need to love or to feel sorry for oneself. One will have only to recognize the other and embody the moment right before hatred, to push it back as much as possible and with the energy of despair to dispel the wars. This will be the we of revolutionary love. And Embracing this moment is crucial both for the memory of our turbulent pasts and for the framing of the complexity, complexities of our presences. And this definitely not the fantasy of standing united, but rather of standing despite the divisions and differences. And now I quote from Susan Beck Morris, we must move with and beyond the categories that push us apart like center and margin. We must move beyond binaries that separate and divide and instead find a way towards connectedness that denies unity or oneness and, in, and, instead, and, in, and instead images solidarity and instead, sorry, pause again. We must move with and beyond the categories that push us apart like center and margin. We must move beyond binaries that separate and divide and instead find a way towards connectedness that denies unity or oneness and instead imagines solidarity and extensions. And quote. That's from uh, Revolution Today. What art practices offer here are heterogeneous forms of communities of spectators in theater, in cinema, in the exhibition, in the museum, in public space. Various moments of togetherness where memory and political action meet, what was here called a social bond of art, whereby the individuality of an artwork meets with the commonality and multiplicity of life, lives. They offer occasions to translate one's own struggles into those of others, to reward the past, open it up, and search for unthinkable precedents or communal heroes and provide sites for those encounters. Yet, most often when we when works of art are addressed and discussed in relation to memory, it is as forms of cultural memory. In my research, I have suspended that framework and instead concentrated on the possibility of working with the concept of public memory and the role of the visual more broadly than images themselves in shaping, negotiating, and resisting it. In his introduction to framing public memory, Kendall Phillips writes, public memories, and I quote, both constitute our sense of collectivity and are constituted by our togetherness, end of quote and as such are very much orchestrated by the effective forces aimed to achieve specific results, form of the common. Public memory, now after Edward Casey from the same book, unlike collective or social memory, is one which exists in the open, in front of and with others. It is an object of negotiation, interaction and dispute, less an object of study than a matter of everyday life and struggle which beside the so-called ordinary people, citizens, engages also artists and academics, also as citizens. And when public memory becomes an arena for collective action or acting, it is a creative space per se, or rather the space of the creative. In pursuing this line of thinking about public memory, I tend to concentrate more on the forms of its emergence and performance than on its contents and effect, or effects. Uh, and I want to talk briefly about um, my recent discovery um, in the archives of the former concentration camp and at the museum at Majdanek in Berlin, in Poland. Um, it is the idea of Helena Kutsuszowa, an inmate of the death camp of Majdanek, a Polish uh, political prisoner, an unrealized, unmaterialized, yet imagined and planned monument to the female victims of the camp and her testimony, which you see on the, on the slide which I want to claim as the founding anti-fascist gesture of the Holocaust memory and the lesson, in a Russian sense, for the future of the Holocaust memory. Kutushova was an architect and a soldier of the Home Army. She was arrested for her activities in resistance and sent to Majdanek from that round group which she survived in. After the war, she was a witness at the tri at multiple trials and the first municipal architect in 45 and 46 of a newly colonized city of Szczecin where she was responsible for urban planning and where she vigorously engaged in cultural and social life. Many testified to her, her restless and rebellious personality. The archives of Polish secret police contain rich documentation of denunciations against her. She was also an architect of Majdanek, the nomination which coincided with the end of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising and the influx of numerous women trans women's transports to the camp. 
She witnessed and described in detail the suffering, the fear of selection, and the death. She witnessed the dramatic death of Greek women. She fed miserable Belarusian kids. Her testimony is full of her incredible activities, as if it was you know, an ordinary life rather than a life under the state of exception that they come with. Um, she witnessed, um, sorry, as a camp architect, she was allowed to move around the camp. She didn't move a lot and saw what was going on. She wanted to see and record. That's at least how she narrates in the 1960s when she gives testimony to, um, of her life um, and work in the camp. So what happens when she moves around the camp, she realizes that men in the separate, in the separate part of, of the camp build a column a column that was commissioned, obviously, by the, by the Nazis running the, the camp, but the, the gossip was, or the information that the inmates were sharing, that this column was actually a monument to the victim, to the, to the cremated victims, Jewish victims of the camp. What, how it happened, the prisoners inserted inside the, the column as they were constructing it, inserted a tiny little can with ash, ashes taken from the crematorium. That was kind of the common knowledge. It seems so from the testimonies. So she knows that she knows that they did it. Um, it's I know it sounds kind of incredible. It's 1940, 1943, uh, the middle of, of genocidal actions, and that's what, what, what the people are doing. Um, that's pretty well documented. Actually, in 2012, uh, the museum decided to send the, the construction because it's still there. Um, the, the whole um, the, the pie uh, to the chemistry department of the local university and was confirmed that the remnants of human ash was, uh, was found there. Okay, so she knows it. She's in touch with the engineers. Um, so she realized that the men were erecting a column monument which was unavailable to female inmates purely, purely pragmatically because of the division of the camp. But what made it good to Shafa was probably, on the one hand, the fact that female inmates could not use or even know the monument raised by men, the monument raised by men. But on the other, she may have wanted to commemorate female victims specifically, because that's what she wants. She wants to build another monument to commemorate female victims. Victims whose experience, suffering, and death demanded from her a separate and meaningful gesture. It may seem that already then and there, she felt the necessity to practice the differentiating looking. The monument she was designing and later recollecting was supposed to trigger the memorial practices of the female inmates and while under construction was supposed to celebrate relationalities served men and women in their need for connection. Her idea was not only to construct a monument, and she designed and she designed a couple of different monuments, but also the, the idea of the monument was to organize a men's commando to arrive every day, to arrive daily in the female part of the camp to help building, to help constructing. And thus, by doing this, she wanted to connect people. That was also the idea that she was describing that she was narrating. This narrative, by the way, the testimony that she gave is pretty incredible. Also in the sense that she's fully in control of the narrative, as if she was fully in control of that reality she lived through. Uh, so she's talking about her conversation with the, command, with the commander of the, of the field where she lived, as if she was actually negotiating with her the construction of the monument. Uh, I think that's it's also a pretty incredible um, a gesture where she's kind of um, confirming as if her survival and victory by, by constructing this, I think, imaginary narrative of, of what was going on. And Kali, the gender division of the camp can be superimposed onto the gender division and historiography of the Nazi genocide, where male experience serves for the universal or neutral, and women may not have access to it or simply feel uninvited, as the narrative does not reflect their experience of being in the camp and of surviving the camp. One of those experiences was being a forced to sexual um, labor that's now being historicized and described and artists have been um, interested in it. So, while the post-war Holocaust monuments and those currently under construction are primarily devoted to presenting or rendering the existing emptiness, the destruction that has become fact, as we all know, and the loss that should be felt, in the case of the monuments that were constructed or imagined to be constructed in Maidana during the war, we are looking at the immediate reaction and the tense that is becoming the past tense. We, with looking at people becoming corpses and corpses becoming ashes, and as an active and conscious resistance to the logic of this production. The initial role of the two memorials, one which was materialized and the other which remained an idea, 
was precisely to mark to was precisely to remark their own presence as well as to commemorate and lament the loss of lives in the camp, the mass death, the events which would later be known as the Holocaust and which were still present at the time the memorials were conceived. This emptiness was not yet empty. It was filled with once and others' experience of horror, violence, pain, love and tears. And it is precisely from the side of horror but also hope that memory may, takes shape, memory that is also responsibility. So when I mention hope, which I realize might be rather provocative in this context. I think it together with Rebecca Selnick, for whom I call from Selnick's work on hope. Hope does not mean denying the reality but facing it. With one's need for agency, it locates itself in the premises that we don't know what will happen and that in the spaciousness of uncertainty is room to act. And the belief that not everything is going to be fine, but rather that what we do matters, even though how and when it may matter, who and what it may impact, are not things we can know beforehand. We may not, in fact, know them afterwards either. And before. With Register, Kutushova establishes in imagination and in the reality of the concentration camp, it is already a huge thing, a space of precision, commonality, commemoration, and lamentation as well as a space in which an impossible restoration of relations takes place, even if temporarily and fugitively. This gesture should be understood as extremely political at its core. It transforms what can be considered public and who can be considered as its agent. Kutushova's memorial, as present in the testimony, and then the testimonies of some other survivors of Maidan too, so it's not her, it's not delusional, I think, I hope, has become a possibility of heritage for individual gestures today and tomorrow and for the politics of the future. It is not a gesture that will radically reverse memory politics, it will not transform the conditions of making memory public, commemorating the past or even the attitude towards the murder, oh, murdered others. Perhaps it will not do much, but still, it will do more than nothing. Um, and as much as this whole narrative that I just presented seems absurd, and this, for some it is scandalous, the fact that someone was thinking about this why the genocidal action was kind of going, uh, going on next to her. Uh, those, those testimonies are not multiple. There are more of those kind of scandalous um, narratives coming from times either from, uh, from World War II or right after, one of them being W.E.T. Du Bois's 1949 visit to Warsaw and his narrative, very powerful narrative, The Negro at the Warsaw Ghetto, that he wrote uh, and published in 52, uh, but wrote was kind of thinking about and writing while visiting the completely ruined um, um, capital of Warsaw. <coughs> okay, now I would like to refer, do I still have a couple of minutes? Couple? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, to, uh, just briefly, really briefly, to a couple of interventions or gestures uh, which have emerged in different spaces and to different publics and in relation to different events. Uh, to me, they all imagine and found communities whose no matter how short histories we should keep in the archives of what, what is impossible. And one of, one of them is a pretty well known, of course, uh, Monument Against Fascism, uh, designed and built by Johann Gerd and Esther Schaller Gels in Hamburg in 1980, I mean, it existed in, as, a, as, a, as a kind of construction, which you don't see now, in 1986-1993, where, where it, disappeared, you know, it disappeared. What's very important for me, also in the context that I, I just referred, uh, is the inscription. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's the inscription on, on the monument, which actually calls uh, it disappears as an object, as so something one can refer to and can identify with, but it remains as an obligation uh, to, uh, for the inhabitants, for people coming in, for people sharing that space, uh, to, keep, uh, to, keep, to keep in mind that that's the obligation we all share to always fight against us. There's no moment when, uh, when this um, can be commemorated and kind of um, disappeared. Uh, the other thing is, the other uh, um, thing that I want to show you, is that I want to share, uh, is the so-called nomadic monument that um, Bosnian-American artist, I guess, Hovich, has been realizing uh, ever since 2006. That's the first instance in Sarajevo. Um, it's the title of this nomadic monument, Stadt Nema, uh, Why You're Not Here. Uh, it was actually, that's the image from Zurich. It was realized here last year, in 2006. Um, 18. It's always on July 11th, 
um, the idea is to commemorate the, um, the victims of um, Srebrenica massacre that took place in 1955 during the so-called Balkan Wars. Um, so Savage so was collecting tiny little, uh, it's called Filijani um, glass um, cups, traditionally used in, among Bosniaks for drinking coffee, and she was placing them in different places in um, different cities around the world, uh, pouring coffee and organizing a situation where people would come in, join in to drink black coffee together. I mean, no words were being spoken, no. Um, you know, no, um, no narratives were being uttered, nothing was, was happening as such, except for those situations of togetherness, of coming together and, uh, and being there for either being for, you know, for the people who were not there anymore, be for their memory or being simply for that gesture. She's actually doing this next year uh, in Serbia, so it's going to be very powerful. And this year it was involved in, um, in the Venice Biennial. The Artemis Pavilion. Uh, another thing is the project entitled The Art of the Possible towards the anti fascist feminist front that was um, realized by Croatian um, artist um, Sanja Ivakovic together with two writers and theorists, An Angela Angela Dimitrakaki and Antonia Mayata, and was part of the Bekmaka 14 in, in Athens. Uh, and it's an unattempted reconstruction of the famous um, Ms. van der Rohe uh, monument to the revolution that was raised in 1926 in, in Berlin and destroyed by the Nazis already in 1935. So, Ivekovic reconstructed only the base of this monument uh, and the rest of it, the very important part of, um, of the project was um, was the recordings, uh, uh, a huge archive of recordings of statements uttered by numerous women from all over the world, different organizations or individuals involved in kind of feminist anti anti fascist struggle. And the, the last uh, thing that I want to share um, is, um, is an installation, or um, yeah, an installation entitled Greetings from Jerusalem Avenue that was installed in the center of Warsaw, but one of the on the central roundabouts, actually roundabout devoted to Charles de Gaulle, <laughs> which also I think gives a, a different, another kind of uh, layer to, to this. So, um, Rekowska is a female Polish female visual artist um, working with public space most predominantly, and she traveled to um, to Israel and realized there were palm trees everywhere, and also you know came back to Warsaw and realized that one of the main streets in Warsaw is Jerusalem Avenue. And, you know why? Uh, and she started digging in the archives and she found out that actually the Jerusalem Avenue uh, makes a lot of sense because it actually led to a Jewish, uh, formerly Jewish district, a huge district, no trace of it, of course. And it was the, the district of the 18th century, um, so not the kind of immediate um, uh, history of, of the genocide, rather something else. And she thought, well, if this is the case, why not mark it and make sense of this Jerusalem mess of this, of this street? Uh, and that's how she um, how she inserted that uh, that tree, <laughs> uh, which was very much contested once it, once it emerged. And yet uh, later it became, of course, it became a tourist thing, you know, thing that is being photographed. If you Google, you'll see numerous images of it. But it also became a, a, a kind of a site where people met to do different things, and the palm kind of contributed to and became this kind of shared space where people, uh, that were, there was a huge protest of uh, nurses in, uh, in Poland, protesting against low wages and um, really bad um, uh, working conditions, it, you know, the palm tree became a nurse, so it was, it was very, uh, the image that you see on, sorry, on the left is actually the most recent intervention that the palm is making, or the palm has its separate life, it's actually the, when the palm joined in the climate protest and in, on, from 1st of June to 14th of uh, June this year, uh, its leaves became grey and they just kind of died, the palm died as a sign of kind of joining in. So um, the immediate meaning of that is, is not important at all. I mean, but it because it activates different kinds of, and it's not only kind of in the actions, uh, the kind of the protest, uh, the protest, but also um, people use the palm for different 
uh, entertaining and um, uh, a female feminist um, um, collect, activist collective Chana Schmata organized uh, a Lesbos uh, mm -hmm. resort there and they were sunbathing in, in, um, uh, in swimming suits a couple of months ago, maybe years already. Um, so that's it. Thank you. <laughs>